Well, I had two talks here, one last night and one, uh, one this morning, and uh, didn't have any title for either of them. So, as I mentioned last night, if you were there, I just decided to divide it up and focus mostly on the international arena last night and on domestic affairs this morning. And uh, the links are quite close anyway, uh, the, but there's a kind of a different focus. Uh, as an illustration of how close the links are, uh, let me begin with some very recent news, which hasn't gotten too much publicity, but it's quite important. It's from Decatur, Illinois. That's an old working class town in Illinois, uh, where the most important labor actions of certainly the last 50 or 60 years have been going on uh, for several years now. Uh, the, uh, there have been, the, the, it's kind of a sort of a final effort by major transnational corporate power to destroy the last remnants of American industrial unionism. They took on the big unions, the UAW and rubber workers and so on. Uh, there's one lockout, a British-owned transnational, uh, Tate and Lyle, which uh, made their money in the slave trade and have been progressing since. Uh, the uh, a second one was a Japanese-owned transnational, a rubber uh, plant. There, the strike had already collapsed. And the third one was an American-owned uh, corporation, Caterpillar, uh, and uh, uh, they've been holding out. They've been insisting on a very punitive contract for several years, refusing to budge. Uh, finally, the, uh, after a couple of years of striking, strike funds depleted, very little support, nobody knows about it. Uh, last weekend, there was a vote uh, of the workforce on whether to accept the, what amounts to the original contract. Uh, the workforce voted 80% to turn it down, and the union accepted it. Uh, and you can hardly criticize them. The strike funds are gone, you know, the, uh, they don't really have a way of keeping it going. So the Strike is over uh, with a complete defeat. Uh, the New York Times business page has described it as a rout, which is pretty accurate. Uh, over the years, there's been very little coverage of it. Uh, the, there's also been very little interest in it on, a, on the part of uh, including the, you know, what's loosely called the movement or the left, the activist groups, the peace and justice groups, and so on. I've paid no attention to it and given it no support. I've seen that a lot. Uh, the, uh, uh, the company has agreed to take back striking workers, but in its own sweet time and on its own terms. Uh, and it's also uh, imposed, I'm now quoting from the Wall Street Journal, uh, the company's imposed strict rules that sharply limit speech and conduct. Uh, workers who are allowed back are not allowed to make references to the strike. They're not allowed to use words like scab or make critical comments on management. Uh, the gag rule, the company says, is designed to ensure a business-like uh, environment in the workplace. The uh, point is that workers are supposed to understand uh, where they are, uh, where they live, and under what conditions. Uh, namely, they live under total tyranny, uh, but it's private tyranny, unaccountable private tyranny, uh, and the conditions under which they live are defined by the Stalinist commissars, who are very tough and not only design the conditions, but insist that they not talk about it. And if they do, they have no recourse because uh, any defenses have been taken away by the capitulation and the rout. Uh, well, they have a choice, since this is a free society, uh, they can watch their children starve and talk about management, or if they're sufficiently servile, uh, they can be accepted back by the pure, into the pure totalitarian institutions, which are run by Stalinist clones, commissars, who control their speech and their clothing. Uh, they're not allowed to wear T-shirts that might have something on them that suggests criticism of the company or management. Uh, and who also determine the uh, rules under which they work uh, and what they get for it, wage and benefits go down. Uh, the work schedules are under the control of management, which is now allowed under the new contract to increase work as much as they like beyond eight hours a day with no overtime pay. Uh, there is no amnesty 
uh, for those who committed the crime of going on strike. Uh, in fact, the conditions are whatever the ruling tyranny uh, decides, down to speech codes. Now, there are laws about this which make it all illegal, uh, but they've long been sent down the memory hole, so they're kind of uh, just on the books. Well, uh, the business press has explained, which is about the only press that's covering any of this stuff, uh, has explained the reasons uh, for the capitulation, for the rout, as the Times called it. And those reasons extend quite broadly, and they're worth understanding. They apply to most of us, uh, as they apply to most of the world. Uh, one of the reasons is that Caterpillar has been making huge profits. Uh, their profits were up 46% last year. That's profit growth was up 46% last year. And that's not unusual. They are high up in the Fortune 500. And the Fortune 500 last year, you know, the big, the top 500 corporations, Fortune has an issue every year where they celebrate their achievements. Uh, and the last year's celebration is really worth reading. They were just euphoric. It was the fourth straight year of double-digit profit growth. Growth, that is. Fourth straight year of double-digit profit growth. Uh, Caterpillar's 46% growth wasn't beyond the norm. You know, that's about where they were. Uh, the, uh, uh, the business press, Fortune, Business Week, and so on, they've been describing all of this as dazzling and spectacular, uh, totally without precedent. There's never been anything like it in the history of the business world. Uh, there are some problems. You read the business press, you find there are some problems. Business Week had a headline on the problems. It said, here's the headline, it said, the problems now, what to do with all that cash? Uh, and the reason is, when you read the article, that the, uh, the sur I'm quoting, surging profits are overflowing the coffers of corporate America, and they really don't quite know what to do with it, so they have trouble too, not just the rest of us. Uh, these are supposed to be lean and mean times. You know, everything's got to downsize and you've got to cut everything and so on and so forth. And in fact, they are lean and mean times for about 80% of the population uh, whose wages and uh, standards of life have in fact been declining uh, steadily. And by now it's heavy decline since around 19, since 1980. Uh, that's continued through the Clinton recovery. Uh, the recovery is real. In fact, there's been faster growth in the last couple of years than any time in the Reagan years. Uh, but the decline continues. That's also unprecedented. It's never happened before during a recovery. Uh, but of course, it's not for everybody. That's only like 80% of the population. And then there's a sector that's sort of stagnant. And then when you get to the top few percent, it's just been shooting through the sky. Uh, the, uh, uh, for example, CEOs, chief executive officers of uh, corporations, uh, their salaries have gone up about 66% uh, since 1980, the period in which around 80% have been seen family income declining. Uh, the ratio between CEOs and industrial workers is the high, by far the highest in the world in the United States, although England, England is catching up to us slowly. Uh, the uh, uh, so the CEOs are doing fine, investors are doing great, capital gains have gone way up, return on investments have you know, gone very high since 1980, right through the roof. Uh, speculators and financial markets uh, are doing very well. Uh, these are people who speculate against currencies uh, seeking to prevent economic growth. That's their main point. They want to make sure growth stays low that's where you move your money for well-known reasons. Uh, so they're doing fine. Uh, and in, uh, in fact, about a trillion dollars a day now is flipping up and back between international financial markets. Uh, that's a huge explosion, partly for technological reasons, because of the growth of telecommunications. Although it actually took off around 25 years ago when Richard Nixon uh, dismantled the post-war economic system. Uh, the United States is the big guy on the block, so it sort of does what it wants, and didn't like the terms at that point, so it just dismantled it, and that dismantled the um, regulation of currencies, uh, and that has led to an, not only an, has led to an enormous growth of uh, speculative financial capital. Uh, just to give you some figures, in 1970, before this, about 90% of the capital in international exchanges was related to the real economy. It was either for investment or trade or whatever. And 10% was speculation. 
by 1990, those fi figures had reversed. It was 90% speculation and 10% real economy related. And last year, according to an UNCTAD report, UN monitor, economic monitor, it was 95% uh, speculative capital, 5% uh, investment in trade. Uh, furthermore, this, these percentages are not only, not only has been there a shocking reversal, but the, the amounts have gone way up. This is out of a far bigger pool. The amount of capital moving around in these exchanges is huge. And it's all seeking what's called good news in the Wall Street Journal in a recent article. It's seeking good news, namely slow economic growth, low inflation, and budget balancing. That's good news, slow economic growth, meaning making sure that most people suffer. And that's un there's reasons for that. If there's slow economic growth, currencies are stable, and you know you make more money if you're a speculator, and so on. So you've got this enormous flow of capital, by far the massive, most massive part of global capital, which is moving around from place to place, trying to ensure low growth, low growth and low wages. This has been understood for years, it's been understood certainly for 20 years, and that's exactly what's going on. Uh, and uh, uh, that kind of good news is, in fact, good. And there are people who think it's good, like uh, take, say, Robert Lucas, who just won the Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, his, he was asked, naturally, as a Nobel Prize winner, to comment on the economy. And he said, We're doing, we are doing great. The economy is wonderful. And that's true if we means the Fortune 500 and speculators in financial markets and the you know, top 3 or 4% of the population. We are doing great. Uh, in fact, the, 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 country is, the economic health of the country is terrific, you know, good news. Uh, it's almost an economic miracle, although not quite yet. That's a term we reserve for places like Mexico and Brazil and so on. Uh, and it has a meaning, you know, an economic miracle is a place where you've got a lot of good news of this kind for foreign investors, for like a couple of billionaires, you know, a few top percent of the population. And meanwhile, during the period of the economic miracle in Mexico, and this is quite typical, uh, wages, which were never magnificent, went down by about 50 percent, malnutrition went up, uh, poverty increased, and so on. But that was economic health. Uh, because economic health is a technical term and it has nothing to do with the health of the economy. It has to do with good news in this sense for the people who count. And Robert Lucas understands, he's a smart guy, got a Nobel Prize, uh, so we're doing fine, the economy is great. Uh, and that's true for the people, you know, that, that this is one of the main reasons why Caterpillar was uh, able to achieve what it did and why others are doing the same thing. Well, that explosion of financial capital, in fact, is a very powerful weapon uh, in the, uh, against the general world population, not just the population here, but against the general world population. Uh, and that's now including the rich countries. And what we're getting is a kind of international structural adjustment applying to the rich countries as well, partly for these reasons, though there are uh, other reasons. But the point is, if any country, say, tries to use the democratic options, you know, say working through uh, whatever, to whatever extent the government's democratic, if you can work through that to stimulate the economy or build infrastructure or uh, you know, educational programs or whatever, any country that, any place where the population tries to use those mechanisms that are available to some degree through parliamentary systems, uh, then the countries will go bankrupt because capital will just flow elsewhere to places where there's better news, you know, slower economic growth and uh, more care for the people who matter, the investors and the business community and so on. Uh, although there is an answer, of course, it's not necessary to accept the rules. Uh, the rules that it's perfectly possible to uh, control domestic capital uh, and to institute capital controls. In fact, it's been done. The Western countries have done it uh, repeatedly in times that they called emergencies. And the East Asian countries, the, the real, the places with real uh, economic growth, like South Korea and Taiwan, uh, they do it constantly. They don't have a problem of capital flight uh, because there the governments are powerful enough uh, to control not only labor, which is everywhere, but also to control capital. 
uh, so capital flight doesn't take place. There has actually a death penalty associated with it in South Korea, uh, but it doesn't happen, and therefore they've had substantial economic growth by extricating themselves from international markets to a certain extent, uh, which is about the only way anyone's ever figured out to have economic growth other than the kind of good news that Robert Lucas and the Wall Street Journal are talking about. Well, that's possible anywhere, uh, but of course uh, it requires uh, questioning the absolute rule of the private tyrannies, and we're taught from infancy that we're not allowed to question that tyranny is freedom, is what we're taught. So if all power is in the hands of unaccountable totalitarian institutions, that's pure freedom. They'll explain it to you at the Cato Institute if you don't get the point. Uh, the, uh, that's one kind of, uh, these are several of the reasons, there are others. Uh, another way in which Caterpillar was able to achieve the route was simply by hiring strike breakers. And they come in two varieties. Uh, one is temporary workers. Uh, that's a huge, another huge explosion in the United States is temporary workers. Uh, the big, one of the, the biggest, uh, one, the, actually the biggest employer in the United States now is Manpower Incorporated, which uh, as they put it, sells uh, temporary workers. Uh, Kelly's right behind them. They had huge growth in profits also last year, way up in the Fortune 500s. Uh, that's uh, temporary workers are, again, uh, an economist can explain to you if you don't know that that's good for the economy, temporary workers. You don't, you don't have to guarantee wages. You don't have to guarantee benefits. Uh, when you go to sleep at night, you don't know if you have a job tomorrow morning, which is very healthy for the economy. Uh, it increases the uh, flexibility of labor markets and eliminates rigidities in labor markets. Uh, again, you've got a good education, you know what that stuff means. Uh, so that's a, 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 another reason why the economy is more healthy, uh, although maybe the people are having some problems, but uh, you know, kind of like Mexico, uh, but marvelous. Uh, I should say in the case of Mexico, there's uh, it's worth, there's some background to things like NAFTA that aren't discussed very much uh, and are much more important than what was discussed. Uh, the main point of NAFTA was to try to maintain the Mexican economic miracle, to make sure that nothing happened to it. And remember what economic miracle means. It means for the overwhelming majority of the population, things are collapsing. Uh, but for the billionaires, the, the number of billionaires is going up about as fast as the poverty rate, which in fact was happening in Mexico. And you've got to maintain that. Uh, there was a strategy session in, the, uh, in Washington of 1991 with all kind of hotshot academics and others involved in Mexico trying to work out, uh, who, and they published their, a report uh, it was, uh, they, they decided that our re U.S. relations with Mexico were very great, you know, couldn't be improved despite uh, pl plenty of murders, like a uh, couple hundred members of the one independent political party have been murdered, but that doesn't interfere with democracy by our standard. Uh, rapid decline in wages, increase in poverty, but relations were fine, although they did point out that there was one cloud on the horizon that we had to worry about, and that's what NAFTA was for. The cloud on the horizon was the fear that there might be what they called a democracy opening in Mexico. And if there's a democracy opening, that could be dangerous because then people might try to get the government to follow policies that wouldn't be increasing economic health. They might be just improving the welfare of the population. So we've got to make sure there isn't any dem democracy opening. And that's the point of NAFTA. The point is to lock them into the, what the so-called reforms so even if this terrible thing happens and there is a democracy opening, there isn't a lot that they can do about it because they'll be locked into place by uh, treaty arrangements, which are very hard to get out of, especially when you got the uh, big mafia don sitting right to your north. Uh, so that, that's the real core of, of NAFTA. And uh, we have similar things happening here, you know, adapted to a slightly different society. So that's temporary workers. Uh, the other way of getting strike breakers is to hire what are called uh, permanent replacement workers. Now, those are not scabs. They're permanent replacement workers. So you go on strike, you're out. You know, this permanent replacement worker brought in. Uh, that's in radical violation of international labor standards. 
uh, the ILO, the International Labor Organization, which very rarely criticizes a rich country, in fact, I can't remember a case, did condemn the United States a couple of years ago for uh, permitting permanent replacement workers, which is, as I say, in gross violation of international labor standards. Of course, nobody here cares much, at least nobody important. Uh, and it makes sense because the United States just doesn't observe international labor standards. There's a whole list of conventions about uh, rights of ch child labor, slavery, all sorts of things, and uh, most countries have signed them, but not all countries. Uh, in Europe and the Western Hemisphere, uh, the worst record is uh, Lithuania and El Salvador, and then comes the United States, third worst in the Western Hemisphere and uh, 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 Europe in ratifying international uh, labor standards. So the fact that the U.S. was condemned by the ILO in unprecedented condemnation, I don't think it even made the newspapers. It's so irrelevant about on a par with our being condemned by the world court. Nothing to worry about. Uh, anyhow, that's all going to be dismantled because Congress is going to cut back funding for the ILO since it commits crimes like this, uh, and they'll be gone. The U.S. has always had uh, quite weak labor laws by international standards, and they were pretty well dismantled in the 1980s, uh, not taken off the books. They're still on the books, but the Reagan administration just informed employers that they wouldn't be applied, and that led to a huge increase in the illegal firings and uh, uh, injuries and deaths on the job and so on. Uh, there was a, the only place I've really seen a good review of this is in Business Week. The business, there was a big cover story in Business Week reporting all of this stuff about a year ago. The business press covers these things pretty well. They care. Uh, and uh, basically what they pointed out was that it's a mistake <coughs> to think that crime doesn't pay if you've got a criminal state on your side. So if the criminal state ensures that the laws won't be applied, then crime pays very well and firing of union organizers and so on makes good sense, uh, and you can get rid of these uh, rigidities in the labor market, uh, like having uh, security, job security, and benefits, and uh, knowing that you're going to have a job tomorrow morning and that sort of thing. So it improves the health of the economy. Well, that's another factor that uh, helped create the route and is quite broad in character. Uh, a thir another factor, kind of all related to this, is the globalization of production. That's become a lot easier in the last 20 or 30 years for technical reasons and others, including this flow of international flow of capital. It means it's a lot easier to uh, have product to, to, for production to be moved to places where you get the most repressed, cheapest, uh, most you know, beaten up people to work for you. And that's a terrific weapon against the domestic workforce. In fact, you don't even have to move the jobs. The talk about job flow is very misleading. The job flow doesn't have to change at all. It's enough to be able to threaten to move jobs, to cut back wages and benefits and so on in a globalized economy, and that happens. In the case of Caterpillar, it was very explicit. Caterpillar explained its business stra its strategy in the strike to the business press. Uh, they said they were using, a couple of years ago, they, were, they had these enormous profits and they were using the profits uh, for, to build excess capacity abroad in places like Brazil and Asia and so on. So in case workers go on strike here, uh, uh, Cap Caterpillar can fulfill its orders from foreign markets and then you break the strike. Uh, other corporations are doing exactly the same. That's one of the benefits of having extraordinary profits, dazzling, spectacular profits, as the business press puts it. Uh, in Boston, where I live, the biggest manufacturer around there is Gillette, and they've been using uh, their profits to build excess capacity, even in places like Germany, where uh, labor costs are way higher than the United States. Wages are far higher, benefits are far higher, but it's beneficial for them, even though it cuts profits for long-term power interests, including the power, including the primary interest of class struggle. These guys are all, you know, real Maoists, just reversed in the values, and they know they're fighting a bitter class struggle, and it makes good sense to cut down on profits to build a weapon uh, like an ability to uh, fill orders in European markets from a Berlin factory if Boston workers go on strike, even though it costs you more. For class war, that makes good sense, and profits make it quite possible. Meanwhile, labor moves to, you know, production can move to cheaper areas and so on. 
another factor, which is again discussed in the press on Caterpillar, is the fact that Caterpillar has been able to shift to uh, what they call computer-controlled machines and other kinds of automation, and that's uh, harm that's again you know a weapon in the hands of management and against the workforce. But there's a hidden story there too. Uh, that didn't develop through market pressures. Uh, on the contrary, automation and uh, computer-controlled machinery and so on was highly inefficient and could not be developed through the market. So it had to be developed through the state sector. We have a huge state sector of the economy here. It's called the Pentagon. Uh, and its purpose is to protect rich people from market discipline. That's one of the reasons why it stays high, even though, you know, you had to didn't have, you know, we lost the enemy, but uh, Pentagon spending hasn't changed because the primary purpose of protecting the rich from market discipline remains. Uh, if you take a look at automation, uh, it was developed in decades through the Air Force and the Navy and so on. Well, that's you know, protected, market protected. The public's paying for it. You don't have to worry about market forces. Uh, uh, so containerization and compu uh, computer controlled machine tools and all that kind of stuff were developed in the state sector. And they were developed in very specific ways. Uh, there's nothing about automation that says that it should be a weapon in the hands of management. It could be exactly the opposite. The technology is quite neutral. It doesn't really care how it's used. Uh, you can you develop automation so that it's a weapon to drive people out of work and to increase managerial prerogatives. Or you can develop automation to put more power into the hands of skilled machinists and get rid of management. Uh, the automation is completely neutral. There's good studies of this, actually, by a guy who was a colleague of mine at MIT who didn't get tenure po po in part because of these studies, I should say. Uh, but they're very solid work, uh, uh, which points out that the automation was, in fact, designed specifically to de-skill workers uh, and to add levels of management. So very anti-economic efficiency, but very useful for class struggle. And hence, yes, there is, there are these weapons now, automation, which are driving people out of work, but that's because they were designed that way. It's not in any sense inherent in the technology. Automation and robotics and all of that stuff could be fine things to just, you know, get rid of dirty work and get rid of management, which you don't need anyway, and get rid of owners, and just put control in the hands of the workforce. You can do that. But of course, it's not designed that way. And in particular, when it works through the state sector, as it did, uh, you can be sure that it won't be defined that way. Well, uh, uh, this, uh, all of this stuff has been going on for radically, in fact, for about 25 years. It was going on before, but there was an acceleration. And along with that, there have been other changes in the past 25 years, including uh, there was a thing called the War on Poverty. Uh, you remember, it went into effect around 1969, and it was called off around 1971. Uh, and since then, it's supposed to have been a big failure, you know. Uh, and uh, since that time, about 19, the last liberal president actually was Nixon. It sort of lasted through his administration. And ever since then, it's been going downhill. So if you take a look at the actual support programs, like, like take AFDC, the big one that everyone talks about. Uh, the uh, New York Times last Sunday had a big lead story on how the war on poverty was a failure and uh, liberalism liberalism has suffered a loss of credibility, it said, because of the failure of this uh, skirmish on poverty. Uh, and uh, it says, the article says, no program was more discredited than AFDC. Uh, that's the real total failure. Uh, and boy, if the liberals can't get out of this one. Well, in fact, AFDC, which was always quite low, uh, has been cut virtually in half since 19, the early 70s. It's been declining very fast uh, with predictable effects. When support systems for people collapse, a couple of years later you get uh, you know, family breakup and abusive children and all the obvious things that happen if you take away any minimal support systems. So yes, uh, AFDC was uh, uh, very much discredited, namely the fact that it was destroyed. The fact that it was destroyed led to very bad consequences. Uh, but again, you're not supposed to know that. Uh, it is known. Uh, uh, there's good work on it. Uh, UNICEF had an important study a couple of years ago 
Uh, UNICEF usually deals with poor countries, but they had one study by a well-known American economist, Sylviane Hewlett, uh, on child care in rich societies. Uh, it studied, she studied the period from about 1980 through the early 90s, uh, and, she, and the, all the rich societies face about the same conditions, but they dealt with them differently. Uh, and she found two totally different models. There was an Anglo-American model, the Reagan-Thatcher model, and there was a European, continental European, Japanese model. Uh, and they had very different, they were very different character and they had quite different effects. The Anglo-American model uh, is a war against children and families. Uh, she calls it the neglect-filled Anglo-American model, which reduced or eliminated support systems like daycare and so on, and forced people uh, onto the uh, labor market, even if, like, you know, so you have to have two people working just to put food on the table. There's nothing wrong with two people working if they feel like it, but this is forcing people into the uh, workforce uh, at lower wages and without benefits and longer hours and uh, longer work weeks just to keep food on the table. Uh, meanwhile, you take away support systems like there's no daycare, uh, and the end result is perfectly obvious. Uh, contact time between parents and children has declined very sharply, about 40%. In fact, uh, the children are left alone. You have latchkey kids, uh, television supervision, uh, with the obvious consequences, drug use, abuse against children, uh, violence, and so on and so forth. That's a kind of war against children and families in the Anglo-American model. Uh, the Japanese-European model was quite different. They maintained or even increased the support systems, and the end results are quite different. I mean, you can see it in figures of child malnutrition and poverty and education and abuse and so on. Uh, the, uh, uh, so there has been something discredited. What's been discredited is the war against families and children that's been carried out amazingly under the uh, rubric of family values. Uh, that's an interesting tribute to the uh, propaganda system, that you can carry out a war against family of child and children with the effects that we see uh, under the rubric of family values and then have a lead article in the New York Times or everything else telling you how the, uh, um, the war against poverty was discredited by these failures. Well, again, that's pretty impressive. Uh, all of this has uh, much deeper roots. It's worth remembering that this comes way, this has roots deep in American history uh, and it's useful to think about them because in some ways, fundamental principles haven't changed a lot in a couple hundred years. It's worth remembering the principles on which the country was founded. Now, the United States is an unusual country. Most countries kind of grew out of existing institutions. So in Europe, for example, you know, the systems that developed grew out of the, the feudal system and the church and all kind of other stuff that stayed around with its lingering effects. Uh, and incidentally, one of the reasons why Europe has support systems and welfare systems and so on is because of the deeply reactionary character of the institutions that remain, like the feudal system and the church. Remember, they were pre-capitalist, uh, and they were based on the idea that people had a right to live, maybe a rotten place, but some place. They had a place in society, and they deserved it, and they had to be maintained there. And that's a pre-capitalist idea. In fact, uh, what's now called neoliberal economics, really classical economics, is based on the principle that people don't have a right to live. You go back to the origins, you know, David Ricardo and Malthus and those guys. Uh, they were, their big point was to try to convince people that you do not have a right to live. Uh, you hurt the poor by helping them. Uh, and uh, the idea that you have a right to live is just a mistake, has to be beaten out of people's minds. The only right that you have is whatever rights you get on the labor market. If you can get enough to survive on the labor market, fine. If not, as they put it, go somewhere else. Uh, you have no right to be here. Well, you know, back in the 1820s when they were <clears throat> talking about this stuff, you could go somewhere else. Like you could go to places like this where, you know, the land was being cleared of the plague that was in the way. And as soon as you exterminated those people and kicked them out, then you had a place to go. Same with Australia. Well, now you don't have a place to go anymore, but you still don't have a right to live. It's important to recognize that. Uh, and uh, you go somewhere else, and maybe there'll be jail or you know something. But anyhow, you have no right to live. 
well, these pre-capitalist ideas, which you get in people like Adam Smith and so on, they remained in, in elsewhere. And they do, they're part of the basis for the kinds of support systems that we don't have. But the United States was different. It was created, you know, kind of like a blank slate. You know, it was the one country that was almost constructed from almost nothing. Uh, and we know how it was constructed, and it's quite interesting. You go back to the Constitutional Convention, uh, which was where the dominant voice was James Madison, the main framer of the Constitution. Uh, and this does not come out very clearly in the stuff that you read in college, like the Federalist Papers, which was presented for the public, so it's kind of watered down. But if you go back to the Constitutional Convention debates, they're very clear. Uh, Madison makes clear that the prime responsibility of government and the framework of the new government that's being established, the prime responsibility of government, he says, is to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. That's the prime responsibility. Uh, then they're secondary things. But you've got to protect the minority, the opulent, against the majority. Uh, Madison warned of what he called the danger of the leveling spirit among the, I'm quoting now, among the growing numbers of people who labor under all the hardships of life and secretly sigh for a more equal distribution of its blessings. Now that's a big danger. Uh, because it, and if you let that danger be realized in the new system, it's going to threaten the minority of the opulent, and they have to be protected. So therefore, democracy is unacceptable. That was the primary principle on which the Constitution was designed and on which the system was designed, and very explicit. Democracy is unacceptable because of this leveling spirit among the people who labor under all the hardships of life and sigh for a more equal distribution of its blessings. And if you give them a chance to do anything about it, you're going to threaten the minority of the opulent. And he used England as an ex that was the obvious example. That was the, you know, the model for everyone. He said in England, if they allowed democracy, uh, then people would, the, the mass of the population, would uh, vote for what we now call agrarian reform. That is, they would call for breaking up the big landed estates and it would threaten the minority, the opulent. And obviously, that's an intolerable idea, uh, as intolerable as you know, today in Guatemala or something like that. Uh, so therefore, we've got to make sure that there's no democratic system. And uh, Madison totally carried the day. Uh, the only dissenting voice in the Constitutional Convention was James Wilson, uh, and he was smashed. Uh, Jefferson wasn't part of this, remember. He was a real Democrat, so he was out of whole planning. Uh, the, uh, uh, and that's the way the system was designed. It was very carefully designed uh, to satisfy the Madisonian principle that wealth must rule because, as he put it, the wealthy are a better class of men, and therefore they must rule, and beside they own the country anyhow, so therefore they have a responsibility and a right, and the minority, the opulent, must be protected. All of this is clear, explicit, and interestingly, it doesn't change. So you get the same view when you get to, say, Wilsonian intellectuals in the modern period, people like, say, Walter Lippmann and Harold Laswell and others who explain this is the left liberals now, who explain that in a democracy, uh, the population, what Lippmann calls the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, uh, the general population have to be kept from interfering. Uh, they can be spectators, but not participants, because if they're participants, they might threaten the minority, the opulent, who have to be protected. Uh, that's a position that goes right up till the present. However, to make it much clearer, there's another issue. Madison himself was a pre-capitalist figure. He had roots in the Enlightenment. And his idea was that uh, the wealthy, the better class of men who had to rule under the constitutional system would be benevolent aristocrats. They would be nice gentlemen who read you know, the classics and behave like Roman gentlemen and would act uh, you know, in a civilized fashion. Uh, he discovered in a couple of years that that wasn't true. And by the, within about 10 years after the Constitution was put in place, uh, he saw what was happening, and he denounced what he called uh, the daring depravity of the times as the uh, rising business classes uh, use government power uh, for their own ends, not for the benefit of the population. They become, as he put it, the tools and tyrants of government. Uh, it's uh, tools because they benefit from its largesses and tyrants because they overwhelm it with their powers and combinations. 
Uh, that's a very accurate description of the system then and the system today. Uh, that's what the wealthy classes are, the tools and tyrants of government. They overwhelm it and benefit from it. They use it to protect them from market discipline, which, of course, they impose on others. Uh, and uh, they want to make sure that it's, their, it's in their hands, and it is not in the manner of enlightened uh, gentlemen of the kind that Madison had in mind. Rather, it's the daring depravity of the times. Well, Madison, again, these are all things you don't study in elementary school where they would be taught in a free society, but these are the founding principles of the country. Uh, and although things have, not, have changed a lot in the last 200 years, as a description, uh, Madison's account of the daring depravity of the times in the 1790s is not very far from correct now. Well, let's have a look at how it's viewed today. Uh, so here's Business Week a couple weeks ago. They say, the Gingrich Congress represents a milestone for business. Never before have so many goodies been showered so enthusiastically on America's entrepreneurs. Uh, the title, however, of the article is Return to the Trenches, because the idea is this isn't enough. Uh, true, it's unprecedented, but we can get more, given the weapons in our hands. Uh, we have to demand cuts in capital gain taxes, which is half of the income of the top 1% of the population. So that's got to be cut, obviously. And you know how much it is as you go down farther. Uh, we have to have deregulation. Uh, deregulation will devastate uh, the general population. And of course, it's horrifying for future generations. But it does increase profits tomorrow for the people who count, you know, top few percent. Uh, we have to devolve federal power down to the state level. That's not a matter of giving power to the people and all the talk about how they're making a gamble on maybe the governors are better than the you know, politicians in Washington. That's not in anybody's mind. What's in everybody's mind is what is never discussed, namely the fact that when you get power down to the state level, the states can be totally overwhelmed even by middle-sized businesses, not just by huge corporations. So if you put block grants down to the state level, you can be sure that they're not going to go to anybody except the pockets of local business by various trickery, regressive taxes, and one thing or another. Uh, so for example, like take, say, Massachusetts. Uh, the biggest employer in Massachusetts is Raytheon, which is a publicly, it's what's called private enterprise here, meaning the public pays the costs of it and the profits go into private hands. It's a military-based corporation. Uh, and they, you know, a country, com company like Raytheon isn't big enough to play Germany against the United States, let's say, but they are big enough to play Massachusetts against Tennessee. And they've simply told the state that unless they are given even more public benefits, they're just going to move their workforce to Tennessee. Well, you can do that if you're a Raytheon-sized corporation. And that means, and the state, in fact, has just passed a law uh, saying that uh, military firms get tax rebates, meaning Raytheon. Uh, so military firms get tax benefits, meaning you shift the taxes over to poor people. Uh, and uh, the justification, it's called a job enhancement program or something, meaning if you don't do it, they just go to Tennessee. Uh, well, that's the point of moving block grants down to the state level and moving decisions down to the state level under other circumstances that could be a move towards democracy, but not when you've got private tyrannies around then it's a, a move to put power into their hands. And all the business about the gambles and so on is total nonsense. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, this whole feeding frenzy, which is pretty incredible to watch, has to continue. That's the point of the uh, Business Week uh, article. And it goes for tort reform and privatization and the health care system and everything else. Uh, the, uh, uh, I just, let me just, uh, finish by saying that, you know, there's a lot to say about this, but it, uh, it back at, this is not the first time that this has happened. It's important to remember. It's happened many times. The period that we're now in is very much like the 1890s. It's very much like the 1920s. In the 1920s, uh, uh, after, this was the period of big mass production. That's when the automobile business was taken off and so on. Working people were completely powerless. Uh, there were no unions, they had no voice in anything that was going on. Uh, anything they did was at the will of employers. Independent thought had been pretty well smashed by Wilson's Red Scare. People were talking 
you know, enthusiastically about the end of history. We've reached perfection, complete tyranny in the hands of unaccountable power. Can't get any better than that. Uh, the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders are in their place. They're shut up. They can't get together. It was near perfection. Uh, then it turned out to be wrong. A couple of years later, in the 1930s, the whole place blew up. There was a lot of popular organizing. Uh, it, there was a democratic renewal unanticipated. It forced Washington to direct some public resources, at least to the general public, not just to the rich. And that sort of went on right through the Nixon administration, after which happened what you know and what I was just talking about. Uh, well, it's worth, you have to remember what the reaction was in the 1930s. When this democratic renewal took place, uh, showing that the end of history hadn't arrived, uh, it uh, caused a real hysteria in the business world. If you read the business press, they're full of talk about what they called the hazard-facing industrialists and the rising political power of the masses. Uh, and so only the fact that this sounds like Maoist red books is not surprising. That's the way the business press sounds. And the reason is they are fighting a vicious class war, and they know it. So they use all the terminology and so on. Uh, so this rising political power of the masses is a hazard facing industrialists. And unless we control it, uh, we're going to be facing a, a adversity. And they started right off with a big campaign in the late 30s. Well, the war sort of put it on hold. It then took off after the war. Uh, and the way it took off is pretty amazing. I thought I knew something about this stuff, but was surprised a couple of months ago when the first academic study came out. This is one of the major phenomena of American history. The first study just came out a couple months ago, uh, giving some of the details of the propaganda offensive after the Second World War, which is pretty staggering, way beyond anything I had thought. Uh, the, uh, uh, I was very self-conscious. Uh, leaders of the business community were talking about the need to indoctrinate people in the capitalist story in order to win the everlasting battle for the minds of men, and unless we do it fast, you know, our way of life. We're not, we've got to sell our way of life, the capitalist story, uh, and the rule of business and so on, or else we're really in trouble. There was a social democratic spirit in the country, and all bars were down. Uh, they were reaching maybe 70 million people a week just with straight business propaganda. Uh, the Taft-Hartley law enabled uh, workers to be propagandized in the workplace. Got a captive audience, you can propagandize them in the workplace. Uh, uh, the, uh, about a third of textbook material in schools, a third, was simply supplied straight by business propaganda. That's an incredible figure. Uh, 20 or 30 million people a week were just watching propaganda films. On top of that, the whole in in entertainment industry was mobilized. You know, the movies and growing television and so on, with several goals. Uh, they went after everything. Churches, uh, sp even sports leagues were organized to, by, to try to sell the capitalist story by instilling the right values and so on. The main purposes, you look through the whole, you know, you look at the movies and that kind of thing, were, were two big things. One, of course, is to demonize unions because they are a democratizing force, so you've got to get rid of them. They're one of the ways, the main way in which poor people can get together and do something, become participants, not spectators. So they had to be demonized. And the other thing, which is a little more tricky, was to demonize government and to create what's now called a mood of anti-politics. Uh, and that's a little tricky because, remember, these guys are the tools and tyrants of government. That is, they need a powerful state in order to protect them. That's why Gingrich and the Heritage Foundation want to increase the federal budget. They're not cutting it. They're increasing it. But they're increasing the parts that feed them, like the Pentagon system. That goes up. Uh, the, and the other part of the state security system, the prison system, goes up. You know, those go up. Everything that goes to people goes down. So you had to create a mood of anti-politics, which leaves a very powerful interventionist state, but makes people hate the federal government. And the reason to make people hate the federal government is it has a defect. It's not that the government isn't bad, but the things that they're worried about are not what's bad. What they're worried about is what's good. Uh, the government has a defect, namely it's potentially influenceable by the population. Now, private corporations don't have that defect. They're pure tyrannies. There's nothing you can say about the GE management. But you can do something about federal government policies. And that defect, for good Madisonian reasons, has to be gotten rid of. So you have to create a mood of anti-politics where everything is blamed on the federal government. 
uh, and you don't notice the real power behind it. You're not supposed to read the Fortune 500 issue. Uh, and so you want to, if you're angry about the world, you don't blow up a corporate headquarters, you blow up a government office. Uh, that's the kind of mood that has to be created because the government has this terrible defect of uh, potential democracy. Uh, and that has been done. Uh, the country is very, you know, attitudes haven't changed a lot in the country, but people are deeply confused about the source of their problems. Uh, and there is a kind of a mood of anti-politics, very irrational mood of anti-politics of this kind, uh, which is simply putting more and more power into the hands of the private tyrannies, which are unaccountable, uh, transnational in scope, control a huge amount of the economy, uh, and uh, have the kinds of advantages that I've been talking about. Incidentally, the end of the Cold War has something to do with this, but very little. Well, there isn't time to run through the details, and you know them anyway, but there's been a tremendous rollback campaign in the last 20, 25 years to try to reverse uh, the achievements for democracy and human rights and so on that had indeed been won uh, through popular struggle over many, many years. It's not the first time, you know, it's happened before. Uh, the predictions of uh, perfection and the end of history were wrong before. It is a gloomy portent in many ways, uh, but we should bear in mind that if the daring depravity of the times that uh, Madison was talking about, uh, if that persists, then we don't have anyone to blame but ourselves. Thanks.